Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the second of United Policyholders Roadmap to Recovery workshops for North Bay wildfire survivors. And uh, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you were at our workshop last week? Wow, okay, great. Um, well, again, thank you for making the time and, and space to come out here. Um, my name is Amy Bach, and I um, am a co-founder of United Policyholders. We're a 501c3, um, which means that we are a charity. Um, and that also means that we're not here to sell you anything or get you to sign up for any service or product or anything. Uh, the reason that we encourage people to fill out the sign-in sheets is primarily so that we can stay in touch with you for the next um, 12 to 24 months as we uh, offer services to your community. Um, we're gonna be doing some surveys um, as time goes on to make sure that we're offering the support services that, that your community needs at a particular time. Now each wildfire recovery that we have worked has its own personality in a way. There are some things that, that are similar and some things that are different. Uh, but we are here today to give you uh, guidance and as you take your first steps on the road to recovery. So as you know, uh, last week we did uh, an orientation where we really gave you sort of a broad overview of the kind of uh, the state of mind that we suggest that you have about your insurance claim. Um, and then tonight we're starting to get into some of the uh, details. And so tonight we'll be talking about documenting and valuing the damage to your home. Uh, Karen Remus will be again uh, the primary instructor. I will give you a little bit of information along the way and then we have a guest speaker uh, who has experience in this topic, professional experience. Um, I'm going to have Barbara Tobin give a brief introduction uh, and then I'll be back to explain more about the kind of help you can get through our organization. I just wanted to welcome you. I'm Barbara Tobin with Jewish Family and Children's Services and uh, we're very proud to be the co-sponsors with the United Policyholders for these three workshops. Uh, Jewish Family and Children's Services serves the entire community, not just the Jewish community. So we wanted you to know that we have been in the Bay Area for 167 years, helping people through all kinds of disasters, and we're going to be here with you for the long haul. So come to us, and we'll help. We'll make connections for you, and we'll try and do the best we can. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank the Unitarian, Universalist Unitarian Church and Mike up there on sound. Uh, for giving us this space. And we were debating uh, whether this is a big enough space. We feel very um, sad when we see people standing in the back, but certainly um, you are welcome to come and, and come on up and you can sit. There's some uh, folks were sitting on that little, uh, little ramp last time and you're welcome to move on down um, to make yourselves comfortable. And again, uh, this workshop is for folks who've lost their homes or had their homes just uh, damaged. So if you are here as an observer, we would so appreciate you giving up your seat uh, to somebody who is actually here to get the, the information for themselves. But to those of you who are here to help a loved one or a friend, thank you. Um, of course, uh, you're welcome. All right, so um, again, about UP, since most of you were here the last time, I'm gonna go through this quickly. As I told you, we're a not-for-profit charity. Um, our Roadmap to Recovery program aims to educate and support you in navigating a fair insurance settlement. We're funded by donations and grants. Um, our online information is all free of charge. We do not accept funding from insurance companies uh, so that you can be comfortable with the guidance that we give you. Our work gets done by volunteers like Karen, who've recovered from prior disasters, as well as knowledgeable consumer-oriented professionals like Robert, who's gonna be here um, tonight to talk about the scoping process. Um, we really encourage you to visit our website often, uphelp.org. We have um, put together a library for you, um, especially for this particular fire, so we've already got information specific to the coordinated debris removal process, as well as all of the typical 
uh, stops along the way on the road to recovery. These are some of the fires that we have uh, provided services uh, after, uh, starting in 1991 when we uh, were formed. Uh, this is our little yellow book. We ran out of them uh, last week at the, uh, at the local assistance center where we've had our table. Uh, we, have, we're, we are moving as quickly as we can to restock. And at our next workshop, which is November 15th, right here, same place, same time, we will be giving out the books. So if you did not get a copy, we will have them at that time. But in the meantime, our website has all the information that's in that yellow book and much, much more. Um, and, and we also have an Ask an Expert online forum where you can go on and register. It's free, but you do have to jump through that little, um, little portal to get in there um, and register. And if you have any problems with registering, you email info at uphelp.org. In addition to all the technical support that we offer at our website and in the book and through the forum, there's also um, an, an empathy and sort of been there, done that resource, um, which is our disaster survivor support network. And that is uh, people like Karen and some of the folks that were here uh, last week bringing those boxes. And these are people who have personal experience and, and, a, and a very special kind of understanding um, of the situation that, that each of you are in, which of course is unique for each of you, but there are certain common threads and, and common ties that, that bind you together. Uh, so there's an email address there for you. 24-7 uh, help on the web. <clears throat> like I said, we have not just the, um, the tips, but we also have a lot of sample letters. So for example, as some of you are trying to figure out what your coverages are right now, um, and you're not sure you're getting the straight scoop from the adjuster that, that has been assigned to your claim, that person may be very new, very green, very young, very inexperienced, or they may um, just be wrong, or you just want that assurance. Um, so we have sample letters that will help you write to the insurance company, create that important paper trail, and say, okay, we want to make sure we have a complete current copy of our policy, or we have sample letters that you can customize that address uh, many of the kind of questions you may have. Um, so again, that's there for you. Fine print. Um, the information provided in this program is for educational purposes only. Uh, we are not here to give you legal advice, and please don't construe this information as legal advice. Um, the speakers at today's program are volunteering their time as educators. Um, and we do not endorse or warrant the quality or services of any volunteer or vendor identified in our educational materials. So thank you again for your time um, and for being with us. And I want to very warmly welcome my great friend, Karen Remus. Thank you, Karen. All right, you guys. So as you know, those of you who were with us the last time, my name is Karen Remus, and I'm a 12-year uh, United Policy Holders volunteer. I lost my own home in the 2003 Cedar Fire. There's the picture. I know, like I said, as I said last time, a lot of you have pictures just like this. And so, again, um, after utilizing the resources that United Policy Holders had to help us recover, I became a volunteer in 2005. So that's what brought me here to you today. Tonight, we're focusing on a, basically tips and strategies. Better, you guys, a little bit better? Thanks, thank you for the reminder. For the dwelling portion of the claim, that's our focus, all right? So where's our starting point? Coverage A, the dwelling coverage, right? It's the big ticket item in your policy. Remember, though, that your actual dollar coverage for coverage A may be higher than the amount stated on your deck page due to extras that you have purchased, also known as endorsements. So again, those extras should be explained in your policy wording. It's so important that you get that full and complete copy of your policy. Go through it. Do you have an inflation protection endorsement? Do you have an extended replacement coverage? You just want to make sure that you've gone through that to calculate what your coverages are. Again, here's a sample looking at a deck page, and you will see A circled, 300,000, 200. But if you go down into that first bracketed, um, orange bracketed piece, you'll see that there's a limited home replacement cost endorsement. So again, this is the kind of wording that you want to be aware of, looking for on your declaration and in your policy wording. All right? 
Extended replacement coverage. Again, most policies today sold are extended replacement policies, which increase your coverage A limits by a set percentage, 25%, 50%, 100% when your coverage A limits are inadequate to replace or repair what you had, your destroyed property. A few companies will apply those extended benefits to your other coverages, um, B and D, but most policies apply those extended recover or those extended um, benefits only to the coverage A. Again, do the math to know your limits. So again, do you have an inflation protection endorsement? If so, how much is that? Factor that in, do the math. Do you have extended replacement endorsement? If so, what's that percentage? Factor that in. So again, you just want to make sure that you do that math for yourself to make sure you understand exactly what your coverage is. The dwelling claim process. All right. Often the dwelling claim process will begin with the insurance company preparing a scope of loss on your damaged or destroyed property. A scope of loss details the materials, quantities, costs, and range of work necessary to repair or rebuild what you had in compliance with current building codes. A scope of loss is more detailed than a bid or an estimate. The insurance company's own scope of loss will often form the basis of what they will agree to pay to repair or replace your home. So it's a very important starting point. So again, you want to provide your insurance company adjuster with as much information regarding your pre-loss dwelling as possible. Here are some examples. Sizes and shapes. You know, how many rooms did you have? What kind of finishes? Um, what kind of windows? You know, did you have casings around the doorway, crown molding? Do you know what I'm saying? What were the finishes that you had in that home? So again, you want to use whatever information you can lay your hands on to recreate detailed descriptions of what the property looked like before the loss. What are some sources for that? Building plans, maybe through the, uh, again, the planning department. Photos, and again, some of you might be like, hey, my photos have all burned down. Ask friends and family. You know, who's been to your home? Who's attended a birthday party at your home? Who's been to a gathering at your home such that they might have taken pictures? Etc. So again, even if you didn't get your photos out, there may be others, friends, family, or others who do have pictures of exactly what that dining room looked like, what the kitchen looked like, etc. So don't underestimate that. Oral descriptions. Again, you know, record to the best of your memory what those rooms looked like. If you have a significant other, have them do the same and have each other look at those. Hey, is there something that I remember that you didn't? Do you know what I'm saying? Because again, it's a stressful time, nobody's sleeping great, so you really want to do your best to recreate um, what you had. Google Earth, go on Google Earth. Are there any images there that could be potentially helpful for you in terms of reconstructing what that house looked like before the loss? Key thing here, do not exaggerate or pad. So again, you're doing your best to recreate as best as you possibly can using these sources, potentially others, but don't exaggerate or pad. Also, get two independent estimates from licensed, reputable contractors. So what you want to do is work towards reaching a settlement with your insurance company that's based on those independent estimates. So they're going to prepare their scope, most likely, and then you want to get two real-life bids or estimates from, again, licensed contractors who could replace that home. For purposes of negotiating a dwelling claim, really what you want to focus in is on the cost to replace the home that you lost. Remember, that's what was insured, right, under that policy? So that's what you want to focus in on. What is the cost to replace the home that you lost? Problems can arise if you try to negotiate a settlement based on the new home that you want to build rather than the one that you had. An insurance company might balk if the proposed new home contains greater square footage or you know, different features than the destroyed home. Maybe you had an extra bath or such. So in terms of moving through this claim as uh, efficiently as you can, aim to agree on the cost of replacing what you had and accordingly, how much the insurance company is obligated to pay, even if you are building something different. So focus in on what was the cost to repair or replace what you had. So again, what we're talking about here is rec recreating as was, all right, as was prior to the fire. 
So what you're entitled to, up to the policy limits. So again, insurance adjusters mostly use a program called Xactimate to calculate the loss and offer up a settlement. That's usually that program forms the basis of that. You might have already received the check for your dwelling claim, the replacement cost minus the depreciation or actual cash value. So think of that check as your starting point, all right? Xactimate versus reality. So that's the computer program that many insurers slash most insurers use. Remember, real life builders don't use Xactimate, all right? They use subbids, all right? So the insurance company is using that by and large, um, whereas real life contractors are usually using subbids to put together an estimate or a bid for the cost of reconstruction. It can be hard to compare pricing, the exact where versus this project-based pricing. So again, keep that in mind that that is a, a challenge when trying to work with these different processes, the insurance company's computer program versus the real-life construction bid. That can be a challenge. Here's an example of a page of a scope of loss. So you can really see the detail there. Um, and, and again, like I said, scopes of loss is a general proposition, much more detailed than an estimate or a bid. So the insurer's numbers versus yours, you know, if there's a gap, you want to try to isolate why is there a gap? Where is that gap? Is it the scope, which is the range of work? Are there items in that range of work that are missing, right? So try to compare that, first of all. Secondly, are the prices accurate? So first, we've got the range of work, which is, again, everything needed to, you know, re recreate what you had, or, and or are the pricing used, pricings used different? Either of those things slash both of them could contribute to differences between, again, your, um, your cost and the insurer's. So again, you're working to try to isolate where those differences are so you can reach resolution. Lowballing. We talked about a little bit about this last time, but since we're talking about the dwelling claim, we're going to dive in a little bit more again this evening. So lowballing occurs when the insurance company's scope of loss, and thus their offer of what they're going to pay to repair or replace your home, is less than the actual cost to repair or replace your home. Unfortunately, unless you possess specific construction expertise, you may not even realize that you're being lowballed. Because again, if you look at a scope, unless you really have some specific knowledge, it can be hard to pinpoint. Are there things missing? Does this pricing look right? I don't know about you guys, like I don't even like going to Home Depot. So again, you know, um, you know, it can be tough at times to even figure out if you are being lowballed, but it's an issue. So hence, the importance of getting two independent estimates to, again, to be checking those numbers. Is everyone lowballed? Absolutely not. But it's a potential pitfall. And so one of the hardest things in this process is you don't know what you don't know. So again, part of coming to a presentation like this is like, oh, what are potential pitfalls? What are issues that can arise? And how do I avoid them? How can you counteract lowballing? Well, Again, get and present to your insurer two detailed written estimates from independent, reputable builders, all right? That's one way. You could also consider, consider hiring your own expert to create an independent scope of loss for your destroyed home. So that's also another option. Then you could work on setting up a face-to-face -face meeting between your selected contractor and your insurance adjuster to reconcile pricing and or scope differences. So these are all ways that you can work to push back against that issue. So scope of loss versus estimate, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but coming back. So as a general proposition, scope of loss, more detailed, but also can be more expensive if you want to hire somebody to perform one for you personally. An estimate, typically less detailed, but on the upside, typically less expensive, sometimes free. You, you might have a builder who wants to earn your business and is willing to give you an estimate, all right? So that's a potential. Just remember that detailed and credible documentation increases your negotiating power. Documentation is everything when dealing with an insurer. So again, a scope of loss will allow you to compare costs apples to apples with the insurance company. 
know, who prepares an independent scope of law? So we've talked about the insurance company um, preparing one. If you want to get one for yourself as part of your negotiation, your documentation, usually either a forensic architect, um, estimator, or a contractor would be the person that would prepare that scope of loss on your destroyed premises. The goal is to find somebody who can prepare a scope of loss that can be compared alongside the insurance companies, apples to apples. So again, you can do a real comparison of the insurance company's cost versus um, the cost that your independent expert has come up with. Tips for hiring a forensic estimator or contractor to prepare a scope of loss. You know, ask them the following questions. Um, have they prepared a scope of loss for an insurance claim before? Um, what are their professional qualifications? What licenses do they hold? And are those licenses in good standing? Ask for references and check them. Remember, you guys, accept as much help from friends and family as they are offering. And stuff like this, like, you know, getting the references. If a friend has said, like, hey, how can I help? Oh, here's a list of um, references. Can you please call on these and give me a report back? It's a very time-consuming task, but one that you could offload to a friend or a colleague who's offered to be of assistance. So again, don't, uh, don't hesitate to make use of people who've offered time and energy to help you get through this claim. Oops. Clarify the extent of their services, all right? So does that cost of that preparation of that scope of loss include time that may be spent answering questions from the insurance company about the scope of loss? Are they prepared to defend the scope of loss during mediation and, and or litigation? And if so much, if so, how much do they charge to do that? Is that a separate fee? Is that hourly? What's the charge on that? Also, have they ever even had to defend a scope of loss in a litigation, mediation, or arbitration context? These are all good questions if you go this route about scopes of loss. Remember, different insurance companies use different processes. Not all insurance companies will prepare a scope of loss to value the cost to repair or replace your destroyed or damaged premises. If your insurance company is not preparing its own scope of loss, Ask them how they intend to value your loss, right? That's a good question. Hey, if you're not preparing a scope of loss, how are you going to value this loss on this claim? And remember that whatever process that your insurance company uses, the goal is to fully document the loss, negotiate a settlement of your structural claim that will cover the true cost of replacing or repairing your damaged property. <laughs> Couple of reminders, again, this is from last week that they bear repeating, keep up your claim diary. For those who were not with us last week, it's one of our uh, primary pieces of advice when navigating these large loss insurance claims. Start and keep a claim diary. A claim diary can be something as simple as just a spiral notebook, right? And what you wanna do is keep track of conversations, promises, representations between yourself and insurance company um, adjusters and or other personnel. So if you have a conversation and some sort of promise or representation is made, um, it can be on any of a number of issues, open up that three ring binder or that spiral notebook. Who was it that said it? Get the person's name. What was the date? Write the date down and write the substance of that conversation. It's not unusual to see rotating adjusters, especially in a big, wide-scale catastrophe like this. So you'll have the first round come in, and then you may get handed off to other adjusters down the line. So you really want to make sure that you have documented you know, promises you know, made, representations made as you go through this process. It'll also help you just keep that claim moving forward, you know what I'm saying, keeping track of what's been promised and what's been said. Oops, there we go. So again, document your claim in writing. So keep the claim diary. And then secondly, keeping, keep your insurer and adjuster accountable um, by documenting conversations in writing. So you document in your claim diary, confirm in an email, create a paper trail, all right? Some adjusters may try to handle the claim by phone with no written records. It's important that you, we call it speak up, so again, document in writing. So if they don't put it in writing, you do. You confirm. And what is that tone that we advocate? Polite assertiveness, right? Polite assertiveness. This is a business transaction. Challenging because it doesn't feel like a business transaction because it's so very personal because these are our homes that have burned down. So it doesn't feel businessy at times, 
but treat it like a business transaction. You're the good guy, you're cooperative, um, and again, speak up, create a written paper trail, confirm things in writing. So again, guiding principles, focus on documenting the full extent and value of your losses, aim to get at least two real life reconstruction estimates, give your adjuster and insurer a chance to do the right thing, but don't be a pushover. Trust, but verify. So again, do the math. You know, what are, well, what is your, what are your coverages? Get that policy and do the math. Apply leverage and negotiate. And remember, a good phrase to keep in your back pocket should it be necessary. Can you show me where it says that in my policy? So again, if an adjuster is saying something, and you're like, hey, that seems like a, an odd requirement or that seems excessive, don't be afraid to push back and just say like, oh, thank you. Um, can you show me where it says that in my policy? So that's a good catchphrase to have handy. Here we go. Guidance available at the UK <laughs> Health Library. Amy mentioned this a little bit earlier. So again, this is just a very small sampling of some of the publications in the UP Claim Health Library. Again, I was at the LAC this afternoon, and I think I told about half a dozen people that that claim library, that online library, is a treasure trove of free claims information. So definitely make use of it. It's a really, really wonderful resource. All right. All right, with that, I'm going to hand off to Amy, and she's going to talk to you about purchasing a replacement home versus rebuilding. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Karen. And um, just a quick show of hands, how many people have had their uh, insurance adjuster give them or tell them that you're gonna get a check for your dwelling um, that's, that's the maximum that, that you're ever gonna get? Have you, has anyone had an adjuster offer to max you out on your structure? Coverage, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, in a, like I said, every wildfire has its own kind, recovery has its own uh, universe. And in this one, um, this is such a large scale uh, that, I, that we are really very much you know, at the beginning of, of, um, of a scenario that may kind of shift in terms of how your insurance companies are gonna behave. We have optimism that because there's so much attention um, so much uh, being paid to the community and so much um, resources that, that are being offered to help that insurers will do a, a pretty good job. But we also have been hearing a lot of people saying that they are underinsured. And the reason I asked if people had been offered uh, structure uh, payments that are max is because very often when, uh, when a home is underinsured, your chances of getting a, a max payout early on are, are usually higher because the insurance company um, just wants to <clears throat> give you what is available and then move on. That, that's not a guarantee. There, there unfortunately are no guarantees um, in, this, in this scenario other than that help is available. That I can promise you. Uh, the California Insurance Commissioner did uh, reaffirm this voluntary claims handling agreement which is on the back of your agenda tonight and you want to look at that. Um, and, and remember the rights that that agreement gives you to some um, advances and some <clears throat> slightly relaxed rules uh, for you to collect benefits. And among those, again, is the four months advance on your loss of use or ALE, and then the 25% uh, of your contents. Okay, so um, obviously a lot of you are, uh, you really can't stop the thoughts from from going around in your head about what, uh, what you think you might actually want to do here, um, even though it's very, very early in, in the process to make those decisions. And again, as we talked about last week, you know, we very much encourage you to remember that um, to take your time. Um, you know, the uh, California law gives you 24 months of minimum of, uh, to use your additional living expense benefits. And it also gives you a full two years to collect replacement value on your contents and your structure. So what that means is that if you are feeling pressured right now by an adjuster, you should not let them pressure you because you do have time. You have, like I said, two years to collect your replacement benefits 
and to use your ALE, okay? Now, <clears throat> California has a law that um, no other state has, uh, to my knowledge, that is on the books, and it's partly because of work that, that we did, United Policyholders did with our disaster survivor volunteers um, and our expert volunteers to say, okay, a lot of people are just not up for rebuilding for various reasons, you know, um, and, and just say, okay, look, I've got insurance on my dwelling. I want to, I want it, but I don't necessarily want to rebuild. So California has a law in the books that says that you can use your replacement value benefits on your structure to buy a replacement home instead of rebuilding. And that includes your extended benefits. So if you have, let's say, you know, 300,000 in coverage on your structure and then you have a 50% extended replacement, then you have, in theory, up to 450,000 to spend, right, on a new home. Now, <clears throat> like everything with insurance, it's not as simple as we would like it to be. Uh, but you do have the right, um, and it's very clear that I am blocking. Okay. Um, so you do have the right uh, to, to use your replacement value benefits to buy, all right? And that is in California Insurance Code 2051.5. Now, remember, a lot of the adjusters that have come in on the first wave may not be familiar with that law because it is a California law. And that goes for a lot of things, actually. California <clears throat> has some of the best insurance consumer protections in the country, and we have the most post-disaster uh, statutes that come into play after disasters that, that, such as the 24 months that I just mentioned, okay, and this as well. So just, your adjuster may just not be familiar with that law, okay? Um, and and that, that reminds me, <clears throat> as you heard Karen say, um, that rotating adjusters is common in a large-scale disaster, and that is true. So another law that we helped to get through, <laughs> okay, thank you, it <clears throat> does give you the right if, you, if your insurer assigns more than three adjusters within a six-month period, they have to give you a written status report. Again, that's, that's in the law, as well as a whole lot of protections that we're not going to go into tonight, but that at a future workshop we will go into. And then, of course, you can find it on our website. <clears throat> okay. So where does it get a little complicated when you're trying to decide whether you're gonna replace your home by buying or by rebuilding? Well, that is, in order to buy a replacement home instead of rebuilding, you need to reach an agreement with your insurance company on the dollar amount it would theoretically cost if you did rebuild the same house that was destroyed. Okay, so this is right where Karen uh, what Karen just covered uh, just now, which is scoping your loss and valuing your loss, right? <clears throat> now, Karen went through some of the ways you can do that, figuring out if you were gonna put that house back, stick for stick, board for board, in compliance with the local building codes, which of course you have to do, or they won't give you a permit or a certificate of occupancy. So part of replacing the home includes the cost of code upgrades, and I'm mentioning that because it often gets left out of scopes, but it needs to be in there, okay? <clears throat> and then, then you know what the insurer owes you, right? So even if you have no intention of rebuilding the same old house, which, which honestly very few people do, very few people put back exactly what they had for various reasons. Maybe they want to downsize, maybe they want to upsize, maybe you, know, they want to put, you want to put green features in. Again, as long as you reach that agreement with your insurer over what it would cost to put back the original house, then you have some flexibility, depending, of course, on the contract and the adjuster and your resources. But basically, it's so many people get ahead of themselves trying to think about what they want to do down the road. Um, <clears throat> and, and frankly, really, um, it's, it, it's, it, it can be hard to find somebody to get, give you that scope because of, of what it would cost theoretically, because, as Karen said, because, hey, you know, who's going to give you that information? A builder, right? 
How busy are builders? Very busy, right? Do they want to take the time to, make, to do a sort of made up estimate of a project that they're not going to do? Not, not too many people are enthusiastic about that, but that is the way to get the full benefit of your structure coverage in most scenarios, is you have to do the as was. We talked about it last week, and we're gonna talk about it probably at every one of our workshops, because that is the best way to get the settlement that you need to move forward. Okay, so, um, and generally that is what your insurer owes you. Okay, um, so we talked about getting professional help to scope and estimate the work and costs that will be involved and including all costs of complying with building codes. Now remember, you should have extra coverage in your policy for code upgrade. If you don't have it, that is a bone to pick with the insurance agent, um, among others if you are underinsured. But again, when you are scoping the as was, or getting somebody to scope it for you, make sure that you get somebody in this community who is familiar with the codes that can tell you what kind of upgrades will be needed. And, 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 and that, that is really just a matter of working, let's say, through the North Coast Builders Exchange. Um, we've got a volunteer who's here somewhere, Marshall White. Will you raise your hand? Are you here somewhere? There he is. Marshall White is a local builder <clears throat> and a longtime friend um, and a volunteer with our organization. And again, um, somebody like Marshall, who's been building houses in Sonoma County for years, it's not hard for them. If you can get them on the phone or, or at one of our events, they can, they can help you identify the kind of code upgrades that you might be required to make based on the age of the original house. And again, at our website, you will find a sample of a scope of loss that calls out code upgrades that may be required. They typically will relate to the electrical, the plumbing, the foundation. Um, those are the kind of uh, code changes that may be in effect that will impact <clears throat> the cost of the as was. So again, even if you're planning to purchase a replacement home, scope and price rebuilding your home as was, and then you start the next process of figuring out what you're gonna buy or what you're gonna do. Um, replacement cost to rebuild versus the price of the replacement. Now, as Karen said, you're going to present your insurer with one or more estimates and you're going to try to reach that agreement. Buying, not rebuilding. Uh, generally speaking, you are going to have to find a home that costs at least as much as what it would have cost to put your house back. Um, and you can present the real estate documentation to the adjuster, to the insurer, and now, um, now that it, this is where it gets a teeny tiny bit complicated. Will I be able to get my full extended replacement benefits if I buy instead of rebuild? Yes, theoretically. And why I say that? Because it really hasn't been tested in court. There's no legal opinions on this. The statute's been on the books. Um, this is what the Department of Insurance has said in a legal opinion that we have a copy of on our website, that yes, you can get the benefit of your extended coverage in order to, and apply it to the amount that you have to buy. Um, and I've given you the site there, um, the link, the California Department of Insurance Memorandum. And again, this may be something that your adjuster has no idea about. And so you may be educating them. Okay. Um, can I buy a house for less money than my full extended replacement cost? value and pocket the difference according to the California Department of Insurance? The answer is no. If I buy instead of rebuild, can insurers deduct the value of the land of my new home from the replacement cost settlement? This is still an open question. Why? Well, there's a logic, okay? Some arguments can be made to avoid having the insurer deduct the value of the land from the replacement cost settlement. Now, the logic that some people apply is you have the old lot and obviously that's a whole different dis decision about what's going to happen there but you think okay I'm going to buy a new house the insurer may say fine but we're going to deduct the land from the purchase price because otherwise you're going to get you're going to end up with two lots and you're going to be unjustly enriched that that's an argument that may get 
thrown at you. But the counter argument is, A, if the policy doesn't authorize a land value deduction, the insurer is not entitled to take one. Another argument, land values are subjective. Why should the insurance company be entitled to its number? Three, if you buy a new home plus the land it sits on for the same amount you'd have to spend to rebuild your own home, it stands to reason that you would be buying a home that's lesser in value than the cost of replacing your old home. So again, this is logic um, and, and, and it's an open question. You know, and we, we're not here to tell you that everything is negotiable. Um, that would not be good guidance. I mean, insurance policies are, in fact, legal contracts. That said, there's a lot more room for negotiation than you would ever think. Um, and, and a lot of your strength comes in your, the documentation that you're able to put together. And Karen gave you some great ideas for ways that people have recreated the documentation about their house that got destroyed, including going to the assessor's office and Google Earth and all these other things. Um, okay. Um, for more information, you can go to our website, um, and I've given you the link there. We have a publication called Buy or Rebuild, and then we also have samples, a sample section of damage and proof of loss documentation. And if you go to our website and you don't find what you need, then you just can, you can ask us, uh, you can email us, info at uphelp.org. We have an incredible core of volunteers uh, that are at the ready to, to provide more information. Now, one last thing before um, I turn the mic back over to Karen um, is um, we have been in touch with the county of Sonoma about the debris removal program. You remember last week we talked about it, there was gonna be a meeting, um, and, and a lot of you may be still thinking about whether or not to sign that right of entry form in order to participate in that program. <clears throat> and I was informed tonight that the county has set a deadline of November 13th for you to participate in that program. That is what I was told, but again, it came to me by a text. Is there anybody here from the city or the county? Okay. So going forward, we're going to try to be coordinating uh, with the city so that uh, we don't have you guys going to hauling around to different meetings, uh, but we're all doing the best we can um, in these early weeks here. So again, I know it's a tough decision, but it really shouldn't be that tough because um, I, as far as what I can see, and I'm not here to give you legal advice, but I'm, I have run it by a number of our volunteers. I'm a lawyer, several of them are lawyers, and it looks okay you know it, it, it is there's a lot of rumors flying around but to us it seems like you you really should not be worrying too much about participating i think it does feel like the downside is a little bit uh, of not participating may may be uh push push it into the column of it is worth participating okay so robert um Bressy, i think our speaker got delayed so, we'll just go um, to so we are going to go right to q a but i will let me just tell you a couple let me tell you a couple things of what robert would have said um i have known him for for uh, a while and he has been one of those experts who who um uh is, was very, very well versed in Xactimate, Xactware. How many of you have had your adjuster give you an estimate that looks pretty fancy um, with, and, and uh, that looks like a computer printout of an estimate? Okay, so generally speaking, most adjusters are using Xactimate, um, but um, you know, those of us on the consumer advocacy side have made uh, quite a bit of fuss about it because um, it does it is very prone to um, to resulting in lowball estimates. So Would you have somebody from the awesome, so great. Thank you. Um, and so I just just to finish that thought um, again, it doesn't if an exactimate estimate isn't necessarily wrong, and you may not even need to pay somebody to get a second opinion, but you do want 
to get a second opinion on the accuracy of the numbers in that report and the accuracy of the scope. Because where, where the adjusters often go wrong with Xactimate is they don't know how to override the default pricing in the system. And this is Northern California. We're hearing per square foot rebuilding prices more in the sort of 300 to 500 a square foot. And Xactimate was designed for the, the default settings are all sort of in the 180 per square foot kind of track tone. So that's why you really have to keep an eye and get a second opinion. So I'm going to, um, uh, and, and, and again, Robert was just going to be going through, and I apologize that um, he, is, he must be stuck in traffic with something. But, um, but again, I, I can assure you, you know, we have been building a relationships here in your community, and I think going forward, um, we will be structuring workshops again to meet these issues as they come in, I hope, <laughs> in coordination with the city and county. I know we already are planning uh, some clinics with the Bar Association and the local uh, legal aid, so we've got some of those going already. Hi, I'm Brianna Khan. I am the Public Information Officer for the County of Sonoma, and I just wanted to reiterate, it was decided today that the right of entry forms, if you choose to uh, opt in to the degree removal program are due by November 13th and you can um, get a copy of those from our website SonomaCountyRecovers.org or you can go to our right of entry processing center located at 625 5th Street in downtown Santa Rosa and I'm going to stick around afterwards um, if you guys have questions please feel free to come up and ask me I'll try to answer as many as I can. Where do we send them in? Thank you. So if you go to our website, SonomaCountyRecovers.org, you can walk them into the Right of Entry Processing Center. You can email them or you can fax them. All that information is on our website. SonomaCountyRecovers.org. Will we get a receipt for our emails? How do I know? Like, I put it in a couple of days. I don't want to find out on the 14th you didn't receive it. Yes, um, you should get a reply and confirmation that they received your documents. By when? Um, that I'm not 100% sure, but I can find out for you. Okay. And we'll have that posted on, the, on our website as well. We'll have that information posted. Yes, and I did want to, to, to remind folks that um, there is a table at the local assistance center um, where they are accepting the forms um, and, pro and beginning to process um, if, you, if, you can, if it's easier for you to go there. So, thank you so much. All right. And again, at our website, we, in addition to sonomarecovers.org, we do have, um, there's a link right from our homepage to our guidance on the debris removal um, process and the decision points. So, thank you.